Hi, everyone. This week, we're very happy to have Sam Hummeler from Harvard uh, to tell us about some exciting things with spontaneously breaking CP. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, all right. Uh, so great. Um, thanks so much for the invitation and for having me here. Uh, uh, having me here. Uh, so like Seth said, I'm going to talk about some uh, relatively recent work uh, with uh, Puya Asadi, who is a postdoc at Oregon. Chen Chulu is a graduate student at Harvard who's just finishing up and heading to the IIS at NYU, NYU next year, and then uh, Matt Reese. Um, so I'm going to talk about spontaneous CP breaking, Nelson Barr models, and kind of some interesting phenomenological implications. Okay. Um, so just to back up for a second and make sure that we're all kind of on the same page, uh, let's just talk about CP violation as we see it in this in the standard model. Um, so I, I think all of us learn in you know our particle physics class or field theory class uh, that CP violation arises uh, from the presence of a physical phase uh, that you see in the Lagrangian. Um, you know, and in the standard model, this is an old story that I know you all know, uh, where you have you know the CKM matrix. In principle, you can have lots of phases, uh, but many of them are not physical. Once you do all of your fermion redefinitions, you're left with one physical phase in the quarks. Uh, in the flavor sector, and that's uh, usually just called the CKM phase. Uh, it leads to CP violation in the K-on system. This is how we've originally observed it, and and really kind of you know understanding that there was CP violation there tells us about this third generation, and it's really crucial in building the structure of the standard model. Uh, and now that we've you know observed it and are measuring it precisely, it really provides a powerful constraint on on new physics. Um, but of course, this is this is a, a simple story. There's another place in the standard model uh, where CP violation enters, and that's in with the so-called data term. Uh, so this theta GG dual uh, term in the standard model. Um, and the first time that you ever see this in you know one of your graduate classes or something, uh, you might see it written that you know you can write this theta GG dual term as a total derivative. And then you might be surprised that this has any physical consequences whatsoever, because uh, usually if you see something in the other boundary that's a total derivative, if you integrate it out, you, you know, throw it out at the boundary, assume it does nothing, and you know, it just doesn't affect any of the Um, But in this case, this is completely uh, not the case. It, it does have important physical consequences. Uh, and it does, in this, this theta parameter does appear in real observables that you can actually go out and try and measure. Um, one kind of hint of, of how to understand this is to note that if you do a chiral rotation or field redefinition of the quarks, you know it shifts this this theta parameter in front of GG uh, tilde um, by whatever this this angle that you're doing there. Uh, but there, therefore, there's really an invariant angle, and that's what I'm always going to be talking about uh, for the rest of the talk. Theta bar, which is whatever you call the the zero the GG uh, the parameter in front of GG tilde, plus the argument of the determinant of the quark. That's in your okay. Um, and the state of bar parameter, uh, it manifests in the vacuum structure of QCD, and so it's really important in kind of understanding what QCD, just, just pure QCD, looks like. Uh, but it also appears uh, if you match QCD at low energies onto the chiral Lagrangian, and you try to work out a phenomenological model of pions and nucleons and how all of these things interact, you do end up with couplings, uh, for example, uh, a pion-nucleon interaction, that is, there are, there are terms in the chiral Lagrangian that are CP odd. And they have these coefficients that in principle depend on, on theta bar. So they're, they're, the chiral Lagrangian has CP violation built into it through theta bar. It really is a physical parameter that you could try and measure. And the UNMD are the three by three mass matrices for in general up type. Yeah, uh, for, for the standard model up and down type quarks. Yeah, to uh, so some extent in, in general later on. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, okay, uh, so most significantly, at least phenomenologically for uh, for phenomenological purposes, because it's the thing we can measure the best. Theta bar appears, uh, it gives rise to a neutron electric dipole moment. So in the chiral Lagrangian, you go out to dimension five, you can write down that there is this, this dipole uh, term for the neutron uh, coupled to an electromagnetic field. Uh, and it has this dimensionful parameter dn in front of it. Uh, and you can actually, you know, act, uh, in case you know, any of you have never actually done this, Anson Hooks tossing notes from five years ago now somehow, uh, actually have this a really nice pedagogical definition where you can derive you know, how this, this dn at least approximately uh, depends on all of the quark masses and the pion couplings and things like this. Uh, but you can work it out and this coefficient dn turns out to be some number, again, it depends on the quark masses, the pion decay constant, things like this, turns out to be 10 to the minus 16 uh, in these units of e 10 centimeters times whatever theta bar is, okay? Um, but now you can go out and actually search for a neutron electric dipole moment. Uh, and people have done this and they've set extreme, uh, 
increasingly strong constraints. So the current bound is that the electric dipole moment in these units is less than about 10 to the minus 26, uh, which tells you that this theta bar parameter has to be essentially zero, at least you know, less than 10 to the minus 10. Um, and this is the strong CP problem, right? I mean, this, this theta bar, I just argued, I show you, it is, it is a physical phase in the Lagrangian. It's some parameter that takes on a value between zero and two pi. It looks and acts just like a phase. You can rotate fields around by, by phases and it changes you know, theta. It's, it's some invariant angle, but it's some invariant angle. And it turns out to, at least as far as we can tell, to be almost exactly zero. All right. Um, so this is an, an interesting problem and it's been you know, kind of a big target for, for model building uh, for uh, several decades now. Um, and really, uh, all of the different kind of solutions to this, this strong CP problem, I think, can basically be thrown into one of two different buckets. Um, so one bucket, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, is you introduce an anomalous classical U1 peche quinn symmetry. So you suppose that there is some classical symmetry in the, in the theory, um, a U1, uh, that's broken only by uh, non-perturbative effects in QCD. Um, so this spontaneous breaking by QCD predicts a light gold stone boson, and that's the axion. And essentially, the, the QCD dynamics generate a potential where the axion then goes to its minimum, and essentially the theta term that we had before is promoted to a field, and its natural minimum is at zero. And that would predict, you know, dynamics, and you predict that you would you would end up with a theta bar of roughly about zero. Um, so this again is is the axion solution. It has you know. An enormous phenomenology, lots of phenomenological consequences, big impacts on cosmology, uh, and it's been extremely, extremely well studied. Um, but there's an entirely orthogonal class of solutions, uh, and this is the, this one I'm going to be focusing on, where instead you assume that at some high scale, either CP or parity, uh, but for and I'm going to be focused on CP for a reason I'll explain in a moment, is an exact symmetry of nature. So you suppose that this is true up at some high scale, and then you know it's an exact symmetry that's somehow spontaneously broken. Um, and so this would predict at least at some very, very high scale, if CP is an exact symmetry, all of the phases have, there has to be some basis in which all of the phases in your theory uh, are, are there and every, all of the parameters are real. Um, and that would predict, I guess, in principle that theta bar is zero. Um, the upshot or downside of this, this uh, idea is that it doesn't, in principle, require any new light physics. You assume that it's some theory that's it's in very, it's a variant under CP at some very high scale. You spontaneously break it. You measure the CKM matrix, but it doesn't predict any kind of light Goldstone boson or something like this. Um, but it does have lots of interesting phenomenological consequences, and I'll talk about a couple of those. Yeah. So there's no dis uh, bosons because they're breaking a discrete symmetry. So. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. and discrete space, space time symmetry. I mean, um, yeah. Okay. Um, well, and actually, maybe maybe let me just say so. So, in the the theta term in the Lagrangian breaks both CP and parity. Uh, so either CP or P would, if either of CP or P is a symmetry of nature, either of those would work. Parity is difficult because the standard model field content breaks parity maximally. I mean, the, the entire standard model is not. I mean, it prefers left-handed. Um, all of the field content is, is left. And so it's parity is, is difficult. It requires a lot more model building. You have to introduce right-handed partners to everything. You can do this as a long history of, of literature working on like SU2L across SU2R models and things like this. Uh, CP, on the other hand, is just a statement about the parameters. There has to be some basis where everything is real. And so it's much easier to model than this. Um, so I'm going to say CP and P somewhat interchangeably. Um, but really, I'm, I'm, for model building purposes, I'm mostly thinking about CP. Okay. Um, so let's talk about a little bit more about whether or not this makes any sense. Uh, so there are actually some kind of interesting circumstantial hints of, about this uh, in the standard model. Uh, so the, the way that we observe CP violation in the standard model is kind of interesting because we see it in flavor changing processes, but we don't see it in things like the theta term. And so that, that tells you that maybe there is some kind of underlying pattern where, you know, flavor breaking, something involving flavor uh, and spontaneous breaking of CP uh, you know, happens, but it doesn't generate it in these topological terms. Um, and another kind of interesting fact is that the running of theta bar in the standard model arises only at seven loops. And this is really important because it means if you have some model that predicts that theta is zero up at some high scale, it's going to stay zero even as you go down to some very low scale. So setting it to zero at a high scale is that, you know, you don't run into any kind of fine tuning issues. 
Um, there are some kind of UV uh, constructions. There's, you know, string theories that were written down a long time ago where three plus one dimensional CP does actually kind of fall out of uh, certain compactifications as some kind of combination of the space time symmetries of your super string theory and uh, some internal symmetries of it. Uh, so I'm, I'm not going to go into much detail on these, but there's some, some classic references there if you're really curious. Um, the challenge is that you want to spontaneously break CP in such a way that you generate an order one CKM phase. I mean, the CKM phase is, uh, again, it's a phase. It's something between zero and two pi. We've measured it. It's something, it's an order one number. And we want to generate something that's order one and not something that's suppressed by, you know, whatever the Higgs web is over whatever scale that this, this guy is broken at. Um, so this is a difficult model building problem. There was like a 10 year period where people wrote a lot of papers predicting, you know, at that point, I think that the CKM picture in the standard model was not as clear. Uh, so lots of papers written where they do this, they don't, and they get something that is suppressed by V over lambda, and they predict, you know, super weak CP violation in the standard model uh, in concert with the solution to the strong CP problem. Um, but getting it where it really is, you know, order parametrically order one uh, is, is a little bit harder. Uh, this problem was solved by Ann Nelson when she was a graduate student. Um, she wrote down a gut model that has, has this kind of construction. It was generalized uh, by Steve Barr, and that's why they're always called uh, Nelson Barr. So given this kind of difficulty, so why do you think that C is easy, but P is difficult? <laughs> that's, that, 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 that's a fair point. I mean, a parody is, I don't think parity is an impossible thing to, to build. Um, uh, well, sorry, this, this difficulty? Yeah. I mean, I have an explicit model that- Yeah, it's this unit some tricks. Now I'm really asking for CP and smallness breaks it. If you don't introduce near some bias trick, you end up with the strong CP program again. So- Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's fair. Um, no, I, parity solutions are, are perfectly valid too. I'm just not going to focus on them. Generally, they just require a lot more field content. I think. Uh, whereas the Nelson Bar model, I'll write down an example later that requires, you know, one additional scalar and one vector like Fermi. And so it's, to some extent, it's, it's simpler to talk about, but I think lots of the things that I'm going to say apply equally to both parity or CP uh, models. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, but let's, let's step back even more and talk about what it even means for parity or CP to be the symmetry of the theory uh, at a fundamental level. Um, so if I really want parity or CP to be a fundamental space-time symmetry, an exact symmetry of nature, uh, you know, in our QFT classes, we all, you know, we usually write down QED or something, and then we introduce these transformations, like Tx goes to T minus X. Um, this is obviously an insufficient definition of parity as soon as you start thinking about GR. Uh, it, it just, this transformation just doesn't, doesn't really make any sense. And especially if you're thinking about a theory of quantum gravity, this is, this is insufficient. Uh, so a more careful definition is to say that a theory has an exact parity symmetry if it can be defined on non-orientable manifolds. Okay, and here I'm saying parity um, CP in this case is really just a parity symmetry where you also do an internal symmetry on on your fermion fields. Uh, so in, in some sense, everything I say for the next ten minutes or so is, is going to be equivalent for the two of them. Um, so wouldn't you say that then the theory on the nori non-oriental manifold doesn't have parity symmetry? <laughs> I would say that there's no notion of parity on there's no global notion of there's no global notion of parity on an orientable manifold. But if I look at the same theory on a orientable manifold, it is parity symmetric. Does that does that make sense? And so now, I mean, maybe maybe to clarify even more, if I'm thinking about the quantum gravity context and this being like a gauge symmetry, then I would think that my path integral is summing over both orientable and non-orientable manifolds. So things are also a can't you also uh, phrase it in terms of the first Stephen Whitney class? Yes, yes. I think I think that's right. Yeah, and and actually, I'm gonna uh, at some point I'm gonna talk about a paper by uh, Matt Reese and Jake McNamara that goes into a lot of these details. Um, in some senses, the, leads to all of the phenomenological consequences we're gonna talk about. And so, some of those details I, I think are I, I'll refer you to their paper. I won't go into too much detail, on it, but yes, yeah. I, I guess. One way to phrase this would be to say that, like, if I have some oriented manifold and I change the orientation, the partition function won't change. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, 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 um, yeah good. Um, okay, and actually, I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about this to, to hopefully make it a little bit clearer. Um, and so, it's the, the, the way to understand this, I think, is it's nice to introduce discrete internal symmetries with background config gauge configurations. Um, and you kind of see how this works, and there's an interesting kind of consequence. 
Um, okay, so discrete internal symmetries. Uh, so let's talk about discrete internal symmetries. Uh, uh, and let's talk about them as you know configurations that we're going to put on manifolds, whether they be orientable or non-orientable. Okay. Uh, the way that the way to uh, I think the nice way to phrase this is to think about holonomias around different cycles in space-time. So if I think about say a Z2 symmetry on a torus, so I can write the torus there, or I can unwrap it and do it here. The edges are, are identified with the uh, with the arrows. Um, now I can think about this torus as two different fundamental cycles, right? One of them is B cycle. Uh, just goes around and it's just the plus one, but I can have a non-trivial background gauge configuration for this discrete symmetry. I'm going to say gauge here. It could be gauge or global. The symmetry can be gauge or global, but I'm thinking about a background of, of the symmetry. Um, and so I'm going to say background gauge field, even if it is a global symmetry. Um, so the, the, the idea is that you can you want to describe this whole thing with different coordinate patches on, on your topology. And the transition functions as you go between the two different patches have to be elements of whatever this, this discrete group is, right? And so the idea is I can put together these two different coordinate patches for the torus, U1 and U2. And now I have transition functions where these two different parts of the torus are, are overlapping. Uh, and as I travel along them, I can pick on these overlaps one element of Z2. So here I pick plus one, uh, and on this one, I'm gonna pick minus one. And now you can see that this B cycle, you know, doesn't cross one of these transition functions. So it's just a, a plus one. Um, and the other cycle is going to, you know, go around here. If I start at one, you know, it goes plus one. So it stays one. As I come around here, it's a minus one. And then it's it's back to uh, the, um, the other side, right? So this is just internal, discrete internal symmetries on, um, on, back, on general manifolds. Uh, but now I can try to think about what this means if I'm talking about discrete space-time symmetries. So now I think of parity as a global Z2 symmetry that's now a space-time symmetry. So I can have this background parity gauge field, but the point is that now, since it's a space-time symmetry, it's fixed by the orientation that I choose for this. So I choose some kind of orientation. I try to stitch together all of these coordinate patches. And now the, the, the topology of this thing is actually dictating what my, uh, what my transition functions have to be. Right? So in my discrete case, they're, they're arbitrary elements and I can choose whichever ones I want. Here, it's actually dictated by the manifold. Yeah. I'm confused by how you're using the words. I'm sure that I'm being global, somewhat sloppy. Global <laughs> and gauge. Well, no, I'd just like to understand what you're doing. Um, so you said a global parity symmetry, but what you're describing sounds like it's a gauged parity symmetry. Here, I'm picking some background field and I'm working all at the classical level and I'm not doing but you're coupling it to a gauge field and you're allowing local transition functions. Isn't that what you would do? Um, it, it's, it's a non-dynamical background gauge yeah, field, right? Non yeah, right. yeah, I'm just picking the background value of, of the whole thing. But if I have a global symmetry, does it still make sense to have transition functions where I use different, have different transformations in different parts of space-time? Or is that a formalism that you can only use for gauge symmetries? I don't see any reason why you can't use it for, for, I mean, it, it, but then yeah, don't, I mean, I get, I, I would have said that the difference is in the, in the gauge case, you're summing over all of these different core configurations. Here, I'm just fixing one and I'm describing. Another difference is that there should, in four dimensions, there should be cosmic strings where you yeah, so, so, go around and come back up to a parity or whatever transformation right. if it's a gauge. If it's a gauge symmetry. If it's a global symmetry, that's those dynamical true. objects don't have to exist, but I can still talk about having a background that's that's not trivial. Okay. It doesn't have any particular physical consequences in, for a discrete internal one. I mean, in that sense, but I can I can use the same kind of formalism. Yeah. Okay. But now, so now it's parity, and so it's it's not it's an arbitrary background field that I have to do. It's I pick an orientation. So say I start here, I pick this one orientation, and now I, I move this way around. I come back to the other side. It's fine. But now this is no, I'm no longer on a torus. So I'm on a Klein bottle. And a Klein bottle, you know, this funny shape. What happens is I go from here, I come to the other side, but I flip the orientation, right? And so now if I start here with this orientation, I go over here. That's all well and good. I just come back to this side, but now I have the opposite orientation. And if I want to come back to my original handedness, it's clear that this transition function has to have the odd element of the group, right? To flip the handedness batch. Okay. So that's it. And for internal symmetries, I can just pick whatever background I want. For a parity of space-time symmetry, it's dictated by the by the choice of background manifold. 
Okay. Um, yeah. And now, so now I've, I've talked about kind of the backgrounds and the, the, the transition functions. Now it's easy. I can just define fields that transform on these things. Um, you know, I can have tensors or pseudo tensors. Uh, for instance, a pseudo sc a scalar wouldn't care, but a pseudo scalar picks up a minus sign when you cross one of these coordinate patches. Uh, you know, that has the has a minus one, um, and it extends to fermions with CP. Here, you throw in your extra internal symmetry to make it CP instead of parity, um, but it all all works exactly the same way. Okay, um, but now there, there's there's going to be a problem. Uh, so so let me step back a little bit and talk about uh, what happens when we spontaneously break a discrete symmetry. So this is, I'm not talking about space-time symmetries yet, but just in general, if I have some kind of discrete symmetry uh, and I spontaneously break it, generally that's going to form domain walls in the early universe. Um, and, you know, in, including CP or CP, but also just any kind of internal symmetry. Uh, and if the symmetry is exact, an exact global symmetry, these domain walls are exactly stable, right? I mean, they're destabilized because generally these symmetries are broken, um, but if, if it's really an exact symmetry, then these domain walls are completely stable. And this leads uh, to cosmological issues because their energy density uh, redshifts like one over it, right? Uh, their energy density is proportional to their area. As everything expands, uh, it just goes like this. And so it very quickly dominates over matter and radiation. Um, and they either have to be inflated away in the early universe after they're you know, formed uh, or somehow destroyed dynamically, made unstable somehow. Um, to recover a kind of reliable cosmology. And this is just a general problem for any kind of model that you're building that has discrete symmetries flying around. Um, and and I, you can understand this topological stability a little bit now uh, better um, if you think about in kind of these terms of these background fields, right? This is, this is why, why this formalism uh, is useful to introduce. So now I consider it one of these pseudo-scalar fields. So it's, you know, has a Z, it's Z2 odd, and it has these two, uh, digit, uh, these two degenerate VEV, that's plus or minus B. It spontaneously breaks the Z2 global symmetry in the presence of our background field. Now, that means that there's a domain wall as a topological work mark. And if I go back to this, this thing where, again, I'm on the torus, and this is just an internal background Z2 symmetry, uh, I can write this down. I have, I've imposed these transition functions on this, on this torus, so it's Z2 odd. But now, as, if I spontaneously break it, you can see, okay, I pick the vacuum here as plus B. Right, and now if I go around, this transition function is a plus one. I come to the other side, I cross the minus one, and now on this side it's minus b, right? And so in order for this configuration to make any kind of sense at all, there has to be a domain wall that's interpolating between these two different vacuum Does that make sense? Um, and so that's this that's that's the sense in which these domain walls are topologically stable. Now this was on a funny you know torus with a particular background field, but I can imagine just taking this thing and and blowing it up, uh, you know, to be really, really large. And the point is that even though this was on, you know, a torus and stuff, the fact that it's global, it has to be topologically stable on the torus means that there's no local process that can destroy this domain wall independent of the background, right? Because if there was some kind of local process where I could tear a hole in this domain wall and, and blow it up, that local process would exist on either the torus background or, you know, a, a normal Minkowski background. Um, and so this proves that the domain wall is, is stable and there's, there's no local processes that can tear hold. Um, okay, so we've, we've learned something about domain walls in ordinary space time by putting them on these, you know, these different topologies with, with non-trivial backgrounds. Okay, uh, so how can they be destabilized? I said that they, you know, if we have domain walls that form in theories, we have to somehow get rid of them in order to recover cosmology. Um, if the symmetry is explicitly broken, it's it's relatively straightforward. The domain walls are no longer stable, um, and so they'll just they're you know it costs some finite amount of energy, but they'll just decay away. Uh, if the symmetry is gauged, uh, on the other hand, um, they can be destroyed by dynamics. You can have dynamical vortices or strings, uh, which arise. They they these these strings, kind of similar to to the domain walls. I mean, it's a different dimensionality object. Uh, on a string, there's a twist that's inserted. Right? So as I go around this, this string, it's equivalent to doing one of these internal symmetry rotations. And so that means that I can put a string here in the middle of this domain wall. As I circle the string, I, I have to pick up a minus one, and that allows the domain walls to end. Right, And that, that means that I can have the ends of these domain walls 
I can spontaneously nucleate these uh, you know, string loops on domain walls, or just the ends of the domain walls can move around or decay together. It, it leads to dynamical processes that can destroy these domain wall networks. And so that's all, that's all well and good. Um, and the problem is that this does not work. And so this works for an internal symmetry, but this does not work for, for parity. Um, and this was the result of this paper by, by Jake and Matt that I mentioned uh, from a couple of weeks before ours. Um, so for a global parity symmetry, uh, the topological arguments are exactly the same, right? There's no local process that can destroy it. It's a global thing just because, you know, it, it would break the fact that these two vacua have to be, be there. But now if it's a gauge parity symmetry, the question is, do there exist parity vortices which change the boundary conditions and have this kind of interesting twist that allow you to dynamically destroy uh, these parity domain walls if it's a if it's a gauge symmetry. And this paper by, by Jake and Matt proved that such an object cannot exist. Um, and essentially the key fact is that all closed one manifolds are orientable. So if you try to write down what this, this string, this parity string actually looks like, um, it, it requires that you know you have some kind of background where you're drawing a one-dimensional manifold that flips parity as, as you go around it. But since all of these manifolds are orientable, that, that just doesn't really make any mathematical sense topologically. Um, so this, this is their point is that these, these objects cannot exist. They have a lot more comments on how you exactly you can think of this as these objects, uh, these domain walls having a conserved uh, quantum number under kind of this more generalized symmetry in this uh, Stefan Whitney class. Um, so I'll, I'll refer you to their paper for, for some more of those kind of mathematical details. Um, but the key takeaway is that these things cannot exist. And therefore, if parity or CP is a global or a gauge symmetry, there's no way to dynamically destroy the domain walls. And the only way to recover a viable cosmology and actually new model building is if you inflate these guys away, right? Yeah. I'm confused why it's the orientability of the one manifold of the string that enters into this because you're, you have a parity symmetry that's acting on the space time. And so it seems like the issue would, couldn't be boiled down to just the question of the orientability of a string. No, sir, it is the orientability of the string. I, I know, but I don't understand why. Because parity is not acting just on the string, it's acting on the space time that it's embedded in. So how can it be a question of just the- Ah, I mean, it's, it's just because I'm asking about a local process. Right? I'm asking if I, can end, if I can end the domain wall on a string, right? I mean, the domain walls clearly exist. And, and I want to ask, is, is, there a boundary, is there a boundary condition that these domain walls can end on? And then that boundary condition is asking about a, a string configuration. Well, I know, but I, so a string configuration, I go around the string and then I come back up to a parity transformation. Right. That parity transformation acts on the space time that the string is embedded in. Yes. Which could just be Minkowski space. Why is that a question of the orientability of the world sheet of the string or, or the space of the string? rather than a question of the orientability of the space time it's embedded in. Because it seems to me that parity is not acting just on the world sheet, but acting on the whole space time. I think, I'm sorry, the question is now I'm going to, yeah, I mean, as I put some words here that are mostly just borrowed from their paper. But the, the idea is that I'm summing over all of these different space times. In each of these space times, your background parity configuration is fixed by, you know, you fix some orientation on your manifold. You perform this, you can perform a parity transformation and flips it around, right? Now I sum all of, or all of these, and I want to write down some boundary condition for fixed sigma here is, is their string. Uh, and I, or sorry, sigma here is the boundary condition on the domain wall that I want to end, and I want to draw this string configuration going around it that switches the orientability. And this, I, I mean, essentially, this ends up being a closed this this curve as I go around here for this to, to write down this boundary condition. I'm asking about a one manifold that has oriented that has parity going from plus to minus one. I mean, that's, 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 I mean, I, yeah, does, does that make some sense? 
Uh, I'm not sure. I'll have to think about it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, the, the details, I guess, aren't, aren't going to be terribly important for, for the rest of the stuff that I'm going to say. Um, oops. Um, but yeah, so, so this, is, this, was the, this was the key result of their paper, though, was that these, these parity strings, which actually people have written papers because um, a historical, though, maybe um, in, in, the, in the charge conjugation case, you can think about strings that have charge conjugation, right? These are so-called Alice strings that were written down 40 years ago or something. Uh, and there, you know, you can do this. And so people had actually written papers. Uh, there's a, a famous paper by um, uh, Choi, Kaplan, and Nelson, where they're, they're talking about, you know, parity is a gauge symmetry and you have these parity strings and stuff. But, but the, the, the result of this paper is that these things, these objects don't actually exist. So therefore, parity or CP domain rules have to be inflated above. Well, people must have tried to construct the same strings. And, uh, I, at least in this paper by Choi, Kaplan, and Nelson, they just kind of suppose that they do and they ask some kind of intuition. Yeah, they try to use some kind of intuition, but they don't actually try to write down particular configuration that this shows that they exist or not, I guess. Um, okay, uh, so now I'm going to move on and talk about kind of the, the consequences of all of this um, for, for phenomenology. All right. Um, so let me back up a bit and, and talk about Nelson. We're going to assume it's gauge. Um, in either case, the domain walls are exactly stable. You can, you can so it make, doesn't. You can, you can introduce a bias. I could. I, I'll talk about that a tiny bit at the end. I'm mostly assuming that it's gauge. I want it to be gauge. Uh, I mean, I really want it to be an exact symmetry in nature that's that's gauge, I guess. Um, but for the most part, I mean, anything wrong with introducing a bias? Uh, well. I have to fine tune so that it doesn't yeah. come into the theta bar. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if I'm if I'm if I'm assuming that it's an exact symmetry, and then you know, saying that that's my solution to the strong CP problem, but then here is this actual bias that, that breaks it. That's that's not good. This, I, is a, this is a much more natural. Yeah, yeah. This this is this is an, this is the natural way. Actually, I will talk a little bit about introducing a bias. Real is like really by trying to put something, put on all of this in the dark sector where it's an exact symmetry and you break it. And then I'll, I'll, I'll get to that hopefully. Uh, Let me see if I'm good. Can yeah. I just ask a question? I'm sorry if I'm. Yeah, no, 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 sure. Um, so you're arguing that if you try, that there, you can't have a cosmic string where you come back yourself up to a parity transformation. Right. There's a kind of standard law that such an existence of cosmic strings is related with having a discrete gauge symmetry. So yeah. should I interpret this as saying that you cannot gauge parity or that gauging parity violates the standard law that there's always a cosmic string where you come back up to a gauge symmetry? I think it violates that law a little bit. I, I think that is how you should understand it, yeah. And I mean, again, it's, it's because it's a particular kind of discrete symmetry, right? This time space time symmetry as opposed to a, an eternal symmetry. Uh -huh. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. I, I mean, you, you I might think, I think normally you would think that there's some configuration space of the theory, yeah, which is simply connected, and then you're modding out by the group of gauge transformations. Right. And if that's just a Z2, then there should be non contractible loops on that space, which you can probe in a space time where you have non contractible loops going around the string. Right. So it's, I, I think, I think another somehow that's breaking down your theory. It's, yes. And I, I think another. Related way of uh, a related fact is that if you are writing down these domain walls, and now I'm telling you that because of this whole thing, they're exactly stable under this, this Z2, you would you would want to think that there's some kind of generalized charge that they carry, right? That that leads to them to be exactly stable. And in Matt and Jake's paper, they do construct exactly what this this charge is. There is a, a kind of generalized notion of a charge that these domain walls carry that that makes them stable. Yeah. Okay. Um, so Nelson Bar models. Uh, so uh, the nice thing about Nelson Bar, like I said, is that it's actually very easy to write down a minimal model that, that gives you exactly how this works. Um, so I'm going to take the standard model and then extend it with a pair of vector like torques. Uh, and for simplicity, I'm just going to assume that these guys transform like the downtype quark. You could do the uptype quark also, that's, that's totally fine. Um, and now I'm just you need to introduce some pseudoscalers. Um, Later, n is going to have to be greater than two, but for the minimal model, n is going to be one. Um, you just have to have some kind of pseudoscalar that acquires a potential and couples to the Higgs. Um, and so now I'm assuming that, you know, from whatever fundamental theory is giving me that CP is a symmetry, uh, I do have to depose an internal Zn symmetry. It can be gauged or it can be global. Uh, 
under which all of these guys transform in this way. Um, and now this, this allows the, the down type mass and Yukawa terms that I can write down then uh, are this vector like mass for the new D and D bar, the standard model down type Yukawa coupling, except for that now, again, since CP is a symmetry, this is a three by three real matrix, at least in, in some basis. And I'm going to always fix the basis where this is a real matrix. Uh, these new Yukawa couplings between the pseudo scalar D and, and the standard model quark permission conjugates. And again, this is, you know, uh, there's some basis in which all of these parameters are real, right? Um, and the key fact, and the reason that I impose this ZN symmetry is that I'm going to forbid couplings like this that look like the standard model Yukawa, but with the, the new heavy, heavy down quarks. All right. Uh, and the reason that this works is now I write down this Lagrangian. So I, I write down this thing. I write down the mass matrix for this thing. I'm just going to call that M0. Um, and now, uh, if I ask what theta bar is, the bare theta parameter is zero because of CP symmetry. Uh, and the argument of this determinant of this mass matrix, um, sorry, the pseudoscalars acquire a VEV. And in general, that VEV can be complex, right? That's the spontaneous breaking of parity. But if they ask what the determinant is because of that one operator that I forbid, there's a zero in the mass matrix. So that a determinant, even though there is this complex parameter here, the determinant is still real. And so this solves the strong CP problem at tree level, All right? Uh, and now the question is, you know, I've, I still have a zero theta bar. The next question is, do I get a CKM angle that's order one? Um, and it turns out that you do. Uh, if you work out what the effective, so now this is a four by four mass matrix for down type quarks. Um, but I can ask what the effective mass matrix for the standard model quarks is, essentially just by integrating out this, this mu V. I get this thing. These guys are the real up the, the lambda D times VEV. Uh, so these guys are real. Uh, but this internal piece, this F is just this linear combination here, which is in general complex. And this is just some order one complex number. So I got a generally complex order one uh, complex number in my mass matrix. And so I expect to get a, an order one complex phase. Um, you know, actually tuning this to get exactly the standard model masses and everything, of course, is is beyond the scope of what I'm going to do here, but it, it, this is this is the general idea of how Nelson Bar works. All right. Uh, I will just give you kind of a warning that this minimal this minimal example is not particularly elegant from a model building point of view. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to build everything that's kind of natural. Uh, there's a couple of problems with this minimal model that are, are that you know I'm going to leave completely unsolved. Uh, for one, uh, this as uh, eta the pseudo scalar gets a vev. It's going to just give you a correction to the, um, the Higgs mass. This is just the, the hierarchy problem, right? Um, so there's, there's an obvious fine tuning. Um, maybe more to the point, there's also corrections to theta bar that arise at one loop. So at the tree level, everything is, is real and it's all nice. As soon as I go to one loop, I start writing down these loop corrections. You can get diagrams that look like this. Um, these give you back a uh, contribution to theta bar, it scales parametrically like this. Um, Lambda CP and you know the mass of the eta are roughly the same. So this isn't obviously small. It's really only suppressed by a loop factor, and I need it to be less than 10 to the minus 10 or so. Um, one way of getting around this, this whole, all of these problems kind of at once is the original point of this paper by Bento, Bronco, and Parada, where they wrote this down 30 years ago, uh, is whatever you might think solves this electroweak hierarchy problem here is, is this quartic coupling. That same quartic coupling arises in all of these contributions to theta. So you might imagine that whatever is responsible for building a natural, you know, fixing the hierarchy problem in the standard model is also playing a role in here. Um, so you can try to invoke supersymmetry. Uh, uh, Michael Dine and Patrick Draper have this nice paper where they're working out all of this almost exactly in this model. Um, so, so there are these kind of fine tuning issues. I'm going to brush those aside for the rest of this talk because that's not. That's, that's some kind of natural in this problem that has to be solved. The thing that I want to focus on instead is that there's uh, what I what I what we call a Nelson bar quality problem. Um, so generically, aside from the loop corrections, theta bar is also going to re uh, receive corrections from non-renormalizable operators. And this is kind of analogous to what happens in the axion. So in the axion, you know, you generate a potential from QCD, everything is nice and zero, but generally your higher dimension operators are going to shift that zero away from uh, the minimum here, you know, these higher dimension operators are just going to contribute also to theta bar. Um, so in our setup, the, the operators that do this just look like this. And this is, you know, whatever the cutoff of this theory is. 
Um, and naively, you know, just doing some dimensional analysis, you would expect that these contribute to theta bar by whatever the scale of CP breaking is over whatever the cutoff of this theory is. Um, and that basically sets an upper bound on the scale of CP break, right? If I want this, these contributions to be less than 10 to the minus 10 or so, that tells me that, you know, if I take this cutoff as high as I can to the Planck scale, that tells me that lambda CP, CP has to be broken at like 10 to the 8 GeV or, or less. There you still get the, the, the CKM. Yeah, you can still get the CKM. I mean, the CKM doesn't depend on any of these ratios of scales. Can you go back to the to the quark mass measure? Yeah. So is the is the F on the order of eta? F F is a dimensionless. Oops, sorry. Yeah. This F. Yeah. Uh, yeah. F is of order lambda CP. I'm assuming all of these guys are order lambda CP. I mean, there are in principle different things, but then the mu d is also on the order of lambdas. In principle, it's. But then what, what is the mm -hmm. 10 to the 8? The 10 to the 8 comes from these guys. So what is your lambda EMT? The cutoff, whatever the cutoff is. So I'm saying, that, even if it's. Up I'm saying, I'm embedding. I'm sure, embedding. sure, sure that it also be 10 to the 8. No, no, no. I'm, oh, saying, oh, I'm saying my effective theory is the standard model plus these minimal guys. Yeah, but the minimal, the lambda is the heavy quark you integrate out, right? And no, no, no. This, this, is, this is before integrating it out. These are the heavy quarks. So I'm that, that's not the loop correction. Yeah, no, this this is this is not the loop correction. I'm what ignoring the loop correction. I'm not solving this. <laughs> already... I'm, I'm, assuming, I'm assuming that something like supersymmetry or compositeness or something is going to solve these. I'm ignoring this fine tuning issue. That is, again, that's the perfect natural way to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And actually, supersymmetry would also forbid these operators. In this so if, so if it's supersymmetry, then we have to the solve these things. Not if I to solve. That, in, in, this, in this minimal case, that would be true. But I think this, this quality problem is, is generic for any Nelson model, right? I mean, whether or not it's supersymmetric or not. I mean, there, there are two separate issues, right? There's but, but see, that that kind of bigger question to worry about. To begin with, I mean, and you are saying you're not solving the bigger question yet. You have another question to solve. Yeah, that's that's fair. I mean, the, the point though is that this this question I have to solve, but it doesn't tell me anything about the scales, right? I mean, there's two problems, and I have to solve both I mean, of them. Presumably, it does, right? Because you wanted to solve the, the Higgs mass uh, problem, right? So that, um, that presumably you, you have to have yeah, some, there's some story that's probably the Susie true. is and how they are breaking. Yeah, right? No, that's 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 probably true, but there's there's two big questions that I have to solve. Perhaps you, I mean, I should say they wrote down a model that tries to solve this and their model doesn't work very well. So like solving this with supersymmetry is not. But yet we should rest assured you're the perfect natural way of doing it. I don't think you should rest assured. I That's think what you should say. I, think, you no, said, I, I, I just said, the I reason you are just not solving The reason you're against the introducing a bias because this is the, the, the perfect way of doing it. This rod is the perfect way of doing it. How specific is this to the minimal model? I mean, the fact that the, there are corrections to the, the bar one corrections. Yeah. Um, because the, 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 the next thing, the irrelevant operators, that's very generic. Yeah. Right. I think that's is this point. also, I mean, I think, I think in general, you are going to get loop corrections to that. I, I didn't, I, I, I think those are both issues with the model. And I think they both require some kind of solution. I don't have a good solution for this problem. I will have a good solution for the other problem, but the other problem immediately tells me something about the scale that's like inescapable. Whereas this, maybe it could tell me, depending on my solution, it could tell me something about the scale, but it's not, there's no manifest bound on what the scale of CP breaking is from here. Just, just looking at the size of this loop correction, right? This loop correction has to be small. Maybe that's, you know, maybe that whatever is tuning these parameters to be some small value also implies that the scale has to be low. That's totally plausible, but it's not, it's not obvious. Whereas this problem, I have some, this problem, I have some ratio of scales that I that know has to be small immediately. That, that presumably you know where the lambda EFT is. Well, I'm, I'm saying, I mean, if lambda EFT is, is lower, then this problem only gets worse, right? I'm, I'm just assuming that it's, uh, that the Planck scale. Okay. Now, and now if I assume that it's as high as it can be, the Planck scale, then this has to be less than 10 to the AG. I mean, if the cutoff is- I would say it's worse. Lower is worse? Uh, I think lower is worse. <laughs> If the scale, if the cutoff can be as high as I want, then there's there's no issues, right? I, I just assume that something happens far off. This this is, I mean, worse, better. This this has an upper bound on the scale of CP break, right? That's that's not manifest from from the loop corrections. So if you say that this cannot be solved by supersymmetry, 
this, well, if you impose supersymmetry, holomorphy forbids these two operators also. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I agree that a supersymmetric model would be would be interesting. And we should try to write it down. But no, nobody's written a very good one that doesn't run into other fine tuning issues and problems. Um, okay. Um, let me let me take a, a very, very brief detour here. And here's where flavor comes into the picture a little bit more. Uh, I mean, in general, you know, I say that you know this naive bound here where I'm just doing dimensional analysis is just some dimension five operator, the scale here is. Lambda CP and, and this ratio is the thing that has to be less than 10 to the minus 10. Um, really, I should think about, you know, these, these couplings in the front all have flavor indices, right? Even the dimension five operators. And so I, I should think about, you know, how this all actually interplays with flavor and things like this. Uh, one, one kind of interesting note though is if I write down the contribution to theta bar, uh, if I write down all of the flavor indices, keep everything explicit, this product of F times eight transforms like lambda D in the standard model under the flavor symmetry. So there is a minimal flavor violation on, on SOTS you could make that would just tell you that this whole ratio is approximately one. And so that, that gives you this 10 to the AG EV bound. So if you're just, uh, this 10 to the AG EV bound that I got from just doing naive dimensional analysis and ignoring flavor, that's what you would get from MFV. Uh, if you don't think about MFV, in principle, you could think, you know, I have some order one couplings here, some order one couplings here, and this is the inverse of the down type quark mass matrix. So there's like a one over YD. And that would tell you something insane, like that the scale of CP breaking has to be like a T. And that's fun. Um, but yeah, the, the, the minimal picture I think is, is more like 10 to the A. And that's what I'm going to be considering here. Um, okay. Uh, okay, so what does this mean? If you take this, this bound on the, the scale uh, 10 to the A very seriously, um, is it really dictates you know, how things have to happen cosmologically, right? That tells me that you know, there's a Planck scale. Uh, there's, here's the scale of spontaneous CP breaking. Our current bounds on, say, inflation are way, way, way up here. But now if I have this bound, this, when this breaks, it's going to generate all of these domain walls, which are exactly stable. And so it tells me inflation has to happen down here, right? Um, and that contains a lot of you know, a lot of models, a lot of potential signatures that we might get from other topological why, defects. Why is, why is it H inflation? That's that's just the bicep bound. Why it has to be similar to T and E? Uh, this is my uh, assumption. I would say that the reheating temperature, I would think generally is lower than the scale of inflation. Right. I'm not being very, yeah. And I'm H, H, no, no, H no. is not the scale of inflation. Fair, that's true. So um, did you say that the inflation scale is the reheating but is it below the inflation scale? I sorry, I said T reheat is lower than the scale of inflation. Why? Uh, well, I'm, I'm I'm assuming very vanilla models. What was binary model? What's that? It's, what's a binary model? Sorry, but by scale of inflation, you mean the, the 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 height of the potential, or you mean H? I mean H mostly. And then I don't understand why T reheat has to be low, lower than H. And T is the square root of H and Planck. At that much now, so. Yeah, dimensionally. I mean, all of these things, are, I guess, are, are, are separate knobs. I guess my, my general assumption is that all of the dynamics of inflation are happening after CP breaking happens, right? I, I want everything, I want it, I, I need it to inflate away. That's 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 all that matters. I guess the specific exact things. That's why there's quibbles and everything here. Yeah, I, I understand that you want the yeah. lower heating temperature. Yeah, yeah. That's um, because you don't want to produce those. Things. Right, right, exactly. Yeah. So I, I would say, yeah, I want to both dilute their energy density, and I don't want to produce any more of these things as I, as I do this. So the connection to 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 high scale inflation. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, I, 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 the heating I, temperature I, can be much lower. And, uh, it could be. Oh, the reheating temperature could be lower. That that yeah, that, that, that is a high scale that, inflation. That I don't have any. So I don't understand that the connection with bicep or whatever with with the scalar tensor ratio. Right. Uh, the reheating temperature could be lower. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And everything has to be. And I would have said that I generally expect the heat, reheating temperature to be lower than the scalar inflation. But you say you don't. Uh, what, 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 why? But why are we hitting I'm, I'm just just more than half the scale down in inflation? Yeah. Okay. I, there's there's probably some flexibility here. 
I mean, it, 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 it's important anyway. So it is enough to assume that both inflation scale and the reduced temperature is below the 10 to 80 degrees. Is that what you actually use? That's, that's what I actually ah, That's okay. what I'm saying. Both of, I want both of these scales to be less than 10 degrees. Ah, okay. 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 Uh, whether that's a separate condition, you know, whether they're tied together, you know, by your model of inflation or they're just separately, I want both of them to be less. That's, that's fine. I want both of them to be less than 10 degrees. Okay. Um, and so this, you know, implies a lot of bounds on, on cosmology and the models of inflation that you can build. So, I mean, if I just ask about like the R ratio, uh, right, this, this bound taking the Hubble to be less than lambda CP would tell me that R is, you know, immeasurably small whenever we're going to see it. Um, you know, even kind of building these potentials where, you know, you, you really do have the super, super low scale inflation is, is not easy. Um, you know, I, I need an extremely flat potential, and that's just another kind of interesting fine-tuning issue. I mean, there's models that can try and do this, of course, but, you know, it, it rules out a lot of very vanilla models of inflation. This is, is really the only uh, statement, I guess, I'm trying to make here. Um, it also has a different kind of bound on, on cosmology uh, for, for some models of baryogenesis, right? I mean, now, again, basically all of the observable dynamics that we would hope to see all have to happen below 10 to the 8 GeV or so. Um, and so, you know, assuming all of these things, I, I'm trying to, you know, say I'm trying to generate the baryon asymmetry from something like leptogenesis, which I might have said is kind of like my minimal ansatz for how you get the baryon asymmetry. Uh, in this case, you know, I'm assuming there's some right-handed neutrinos or something that have an asymmetric decay that generates this asymmetry. I need these guys, you know, in, in most of these models, I, I just have this thermal bath of right-handed neutrinos that, that do all of this decay. Uh, and this, there's this interesting kind of bound by Davis and Ibarra um, that tells me that, you know, if these guys are thermal, that tells me what their mass has to be. The asymmetry that you can actually get depends indirectly on their mass. And so just requiring that the reheat temperature is greater than the mass of these guys, if it's really thermal up to Genesis, tells me that I need a high enough reheat temperature to generate the asymmetry via, via left to genesis. Yeah, so do you actually use the assumption that the heat temperature is below the inflation scale down inflation? I don't, yeah. I don't that, that middle, that middle less than sign, I don't actually require here. It's really just that the reheat temperature is lower than 10 to the 8 G. Yeah, so it's a, you, you, um, can, you can ignore the stage inflation, right? Here, I'm only asking about the bound of the reheat temperature. But if the CP symmetry breaking field is weakly coupled, so even if the temperature, reheat temperature is above the CP breaking scale, it doesn't lead to the restoration of symmetry because the summer mass can be smaller. That could be. Uh, but let's see. But I don't, I mean, it could no, be a little bit, but I don't. Perhaps not too much. Small. Not too much. Small. Maybe yeah. by a loop factor. Uh, by a loop factor. Uh, in, uh, yeah, we may be by yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Okay. But so this is this is a, a funny bound just because you know I need a high enough reheat temperature for thermal optogenesis. And really I need it to be you know more like the reheat temperature of closer to 10 to the 9 G. And here I'm saying I'm, I'm below that. And so maybe there's a tiny sliver of perimeter space, but it, it does constrain kind of these middle models. Okay. Um so this is this is all basically to say that I would really like to get around this, this quality problem, right? So there's, there's two ways that I think to, to do this. One, uh, which I think is, is your favorite model, and, and this is why I hinted I was gonna come back to, is to sequester the CP violation in a hidden sector. Um, and and uh, the other is to alleviate the quality problem by forbidding these number of operators. Um, so I'm mostly going to talk about this. This is the models that we introduced in our paper, uh, but I can't say, I, I'm gonna say a little bit about this idea of sequestering. Okay. So, one possibility is that I assume that CP is broken in a hidden sector first, um, maybe a supersymmetric hidden sector. Uh, and now I assume that CP is broken spontaneously in that hidden sector. Um, now that, that the quality, the, this bound on the CP breaking scale of 10 to the AGV doesn't apply to that hidden sector because that's not interfacing with the standard model of quark mass matrices at all, right? So I can have that breaking happen in, way at some very, very high scale, right? And now that will generate stable domain walls, which then I have to inflate away, but that's fine. I can have that happen way up here, have inflation occur. And then I break, I have small interactions with the visible sector, which
which create, create this effective explicit CP violation. And this is essentially just this bias that you're asking for, right? Um, so now my visible sector has a, an approximate CP symmetry broken by the small bias term. Um, the visible sector, now CP breaking is going to happen again in the visible sector. Uh, that again will give me domain walls, but because this bias term exists, those domain walls are now unstable. So that 10 to the 8 GV bound applies, but that's fine because you know now I can just these, these domain walls are unstable and everything is fine. I got confused. So yeah. why the effective field theory scale now in Planck in that case? So the 10 to 8 came from this. Uh, oh no, that's true. That, that's a that's a fair point. There the, now I guess the effective field theory scale exactly. would be this hidden sector. Mm -hmm. But that hidden sector I could put up as high as yeah, it. I, I, I could put it as in Planck or whatever. Yeah. No, that's true. So there might be a slightly stronger bound by doing this. And that's an interesting point. I mean, there's there's some challenges to this, right? I mean, I want to keep, you know, this this bias term is going to give you a contribution to theta bar. So I still have something that I have to make sure that's not too big. I have to have this explicit thing. I, I want to build this model where they really are separated by, by a lot and still kind of satisfy this bound if this bound doesn't get much stronger and kind of still give me some issues. Um, and, you know, maybe I have to have a short enough... I mean, these domain walls are no longer going to be stable, but they could be long lived depending on how big all of this breaking is. Um, so, this is an interesting model building problem that I don't think anybody has actually tried to write down. Sorry, this was for global or gauge CP? Either. What? So, I, I have CP broken. I have CP is, I mean, my real global or gauge true fundamental CP breaking spontaneously broken in the hidden sector. So now from the visible sector, I still have something that looks like CP violation, but it's not an exact symmetry anymore. But the domain wall is, is made of uh, the hidden sector stuff. True, yeah. Why is that a bias? Maybe it's not a bias sector. in the way. Bias, you need uh, a explicit breaking. Right? I mean, for everybody. It, is, it is, so I, I assume that I have some small interaction interactions with the hidden sector. It's not, and there, those could inherit some CP break. But, but that's not actually CP broken, system. right? That, that's not broken. That's not the, Spontaneous the, breaking just, just makes things not manually realized. True. Yeah, it's not the explicit breaking. That, that is a, and from the, this Bona linear 10 to AGB field, it looks like it's it looks like an explicit breaking. Yeah, but, the, but the domain wall is made of the domain wall. The domain walls are from the hidden sector. I was sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. The domain walls from the hidden sector are still absolutely stable. None of that's changed. That just the point is just that that can all happen at some very, very high scale. But you no, also have a, a visible sector domain walls. Oh, now I could gen I could separately generate visible sector domain walls when I spontaneously break some runs of the to generate the CKM phase. I still have to get a CKM phase that might involve more explicit breaking uh, or another kind of spontaneous thing. Like you're you're breaking. Two, and that could generate more domain walls. You need a two spontaneous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I still have to generate a CKM phase. That's, that's all. I mean, unless you want to get all of the CKM phase from from the hidden sector, from the hidden sector, maybe. Uh, but you have to get something order one, and I'm putting very small interactions with you. I'm, yeah, that, I, nobody's written down a model that does this, and so I, I don't know exactly how it all works. But it, it's this is an interesting problem to try and solve. Yeah. You had a question. Sorry. Are there any implications for the neutrino sector uh, in this or in the general picture? I mean, in my general picture, you know, I have a bound if. If I have this bound on optogenesis, that has some strong implications for the neutrino sector. If I have this hidden sector breaking, uh, it, sorry, I mean, I should say, I mean, I, I have to generate a PM and S phase also, I guess. Uh, I don't know what that phase is, so I don't know whether or not I want to generate a big one or a small one yet. Um, but in principle, you would just mimic the exact same story with the leptons as I do for the quarks to generate the, the, the PM and S phase as opposed to the CKM phase. But otherwise, I think it's entirely. Yeah, is that okay? You had a question. Is there no worry about the running of theta now? Oh, that's that's true. I mean, now if I if I have you know this other model where I have this yeah. explicit this explicit quote unquote CP breaking, yeah, theta might run. I mean, this yeah. Uh, but so you'll have to somehow ensure that even if it starts small, it stays small. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's true. I still have to keep. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I still have to make sure that theta bar is, is kept small in this vector. 
um, which is, I don't think it's obvious, but yeah, yeah it's, it's, a, it's something you could try to work out. Yeah. Um, and and yeah. Sam, we've been asking lots of questions, but I yeah. want to, it, it, it is, it is past time. Hour. Okay, so, so, so let me, let me go over this last model in, in two minutes. I don't think it'll take very long. Um, one other way of, of trying to ameliorate this quality problem is to just introduce some kind of symmetry that forbids the dimension five operators, right? If these dimension five operators are forbidden by some symmetry, I mean, again, I'm not solving the, the hierarchy problem, but at least I can get around this bound of 10 to the A GV. Uh, one way to do this is to just promote these, assume that this D D bar transform under some new chiral symmetry. Uh, I call that E1 of X. Um, I have to introduce some new scalar to give them a mass. Uh, everything else in my analysis of this minimal model is exactly the same. Um, and now the E1X just replaces that discrete ZN symmetry that I, I had before. Uh, the nice thing is that you might think that this leads to some kind of obviously anomalous solution, um, but with very, very minimal field content, so one extra additional pair of vector-like fermions, uh, essentially you make this hidden sector, uh, this hidden U1X, just a linear combination of hypercharge and baryon number, all of the anomalies and the mixed anomalies cancel out. Um, and so this is, you know, a very, very minimal model that at least does not suffer from this quality problem at dimension Four, five. five at dimension five. Um, so you do get, uh, so you get no other renormalizable operators, the dimension five operators are forbidden. The quality problem comes back into play at dimension six, um, but that buys you five orders of magnitude or so on, on this CP breaking scale. Um, so that recovers quite a bit of the cosmology that you might be interested in. Right? That's where our bounds of inflation are. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. That's you're saying it's fine. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, great. So that's that brings me to my last slide. Um, so an exact CT symmetry is an interesting avenue for trying to solve the strong CP problem. Um, it leads to kind of deep questions about what the nature of this kind of symmetry means. It's kind of interesting connections to, to quantum gravity and things like this. Uh, in particular, there's this phenomenological issue of these exactly stable domain walls. Um, and so that coupled with the quality problem kind of leads to these interesting bounds on how these models might actually work. Um, so we introduced one kind of simple model that alleviates this problem and, and gives you, you know, a relatively standard cosmology. Um, but there's lots of kind of, you know, future directions for model building challenges in here. Uh, and that's all I have. Thanks a bunch. Thank you, Sam. Great. We weren't shy about questions during the talk, but any, any further questions for Sam? Okay, everything's very clear. Yeah. Uh, thank you again. Right. Anyway, we can test this model. <laughs> <laughs> it's tough. I mean, it's not an official question. We clap twice. No, no. Can I turn the recording off? Do you want to yeah. speak on sensor? Then? I well, we can put these on YouTube. Oh, okay. if you don't want. Well, we can turn it on. I, I, it doesn't matter. I mean, I will say one one kind of fun thing is that, you know, if you saw a gravitational wave signature of some topological defects, you know, happening at some higher scale, that rules out a lot of these minimal things, right? That tells you that, you know, inflation is not, I mean, if you get some signal of inflation that's happening at a much higher scale, that tells you that CP is not breaking in some minimal way that, that works at a, at a much lower scale. Right? So uh, that's not a confirmation of these models by any means, but it is a and that, that's the confirmation of the No, I, I think the that's right. I, I think the the interesting connection is this one with flavor. Is, is if you have some kind of flavor observable that you could actually try and measure. You are celebrating that now we're pushing this even higher. Yeah, so, no, that's that's true. Uh, which means that there's no that's true. Yeah, yeah. So in some sense, this is it's challenging to confirm this. That that, that I totally.